as we continue in our journey through the letter of 1 Corinthians, I just want to ask you, brothers and sisters, what is the substance of your life's work? As we saw this beautiful slideshow, as you look at this, you see work. You see people serving. Um, I've got a picture here of the worship team. I was, I was just blessed and pleasantly shocked to see how excellent that was. I mean, I shouldn't be. It's like our church is gifted in worship. It's a, it's, it's a blessing. It's just amazing how talented so many of you people are. And, and this is what I was seeing on stage. I'm like, wow, the, the kids loved it. There was so much energy. The songs were right on. And yet to have that happen, it means that the group of people who are up there leading, they'd met together like week after week after week after week, giving of their time, working on it, running into problems, not giving up, changing stuff around, trying it again, and going again and again and again. And what came out was so awesome for all of us. And yet it, there, was a, there was time, a price to be paid for that. What is the substance of your life's work? Things like this that I'm showing on this picture, it takes a lot of extra work, you know? And, and this is something, it's not just about Lifeline Camp. That's what Lifeline Camp was, was, was like. It was all kinds of people doing extra work that nobody was seeing in order for the kids to feel like they were incredibly special, like they were loved of God in a special way. And you know what? That's what I see in our church fellowship as a whole. I see people not looking for the praise of others, right? Looking for the praise that comes from God, doing work that, that nobody sees, right? I had, I had a great cup of coffee this morning. Anybody maybe had a cup of coffee this morning? There's somebody here quite early, usually a team of people, and they're doing that all the time, and they're doing it through both of our services. And, and you know what that is? That's a blessing, and, and sometimes if that's all we've known, because that's we've only just been in this church, we don't realize that other places, they, they don't have people working like that on coffee. For what purpose? So, so we can have coffee? No, so that new people coming to our church feel welcome here. They feel like somebody cared about them. So the kids that come to our camp feel, wow, we won this particular challenge, and look at that, they rolled out literally the red carpet for us. How amazing is that? I, I kid you not. I'm certain of it. There are children who will remember that table. They'll remember that worship. They'll remember counselors who love them for the rest of their lives here on earth and forever because, because it was awesome and it was authentic. It was a true sacrifice. So what is the substance of your life's work? Is it the work that we do during the week, the hours that we put in, doing the tasks that we must in order to ensure that life continues? Is that all of our legacy? Is earning the living truly our life's work? Are the accomplishments that we have at work or the accomplishments that our children that we're raising, that they reach, are those the substance of our work? Now, Clearly, supporting our families is totally God-honoring, and it's something that I see strongly exemplified in our church. And, and I'm grateful that so many of us are, by our hard and honest work, that God is giving us the ability to support our families. It's blessed by God and the apostles in, in the Bible. But our life's work is so much more than simply the tasks that we do. And, and I want to remind us of that today as we look at uh, this chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians and as we see how Paul is saying, you know, there is a life's work that is happening right alongside what you do every day. And there is a life's work that is part of your involvement in the family of God, your, your giving to the family of God, first and foremost, of your time, your talents, your skills, your efforts. So as we read 1 Corinthians 3 today, part, a portion of it, let's pay special attention to how God looks at our life's work and how it will be tested. So 1 Corinthians 3, 
chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, beginning. Brothers and sisters, he says, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were, you were not ready for it yet. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one of you says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. You are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. Now, there's something that we talked about mostly last week, and I, I just don't want to, I want to remind us, I don't want us to forget, that Paul, once again, he several times repeats our necessity not to quarrel over different teachers of the law, different teachers of, of the gospel, excuse me. And this is very important for us in this day, when uh, through the various means of communication, through YouTube, through others, you can listen to absolutely every kind of preacher and teacher that anyone could ever have imagined. And some of them uh, make their living off of, off of blowing up different viewpoints and encouraging division because of them. And so I just want to caution you. I want to caution you about that, right? It's important that we in the family of God are very, very aware of things that can divide us. When you look at a camp like Lifeline Camp, where everyone comes together for the purpose of seeing children saved and in faith to Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, you realize that, hey, for these kids, you know, splitting hairs of doctrine doesn't matter. What matters is that they have a firm foundation in their identity as beloved children of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? That's what they need. They don't need to, to come to, to, to decide about arguments that, unfortunately, people have wasted their time on for hundreds of hundreds of years in the church. Guess what? Just like the kids, we don't need to spend time on these questions either. Instead, we need to follow Jesus. We need to know him. We need to know the central uh, doctrines and teachings of our faith, and we need to know how to communicate those to others without using Christianese terms or theology. So friends, whatever can divide us, be very careful to avoid it. Be very careful. I encourage us all to continue, especially in this season where the enemy uses everything possible to divide us, not to be divided, not to be divided by def different teachings of doctrine, not to be divided by, by the flags of nationalism, 
As one wise brother in our congregation has said, he said, hey, there's only one flag I can fly, and that's Jesus Christ. One flag over all, over, over the flag of this country, over the flag of any country. Because just like political figures will, countries will disappoint you. And if you've delved into the history of any country on earth, that history is filled with sin and shame as well as glory, sometimes no glory. And yet in Jesus Christ, there is perfection of glory. This is someone that in following, we will never be disappointed by. So I I don't want to leave that out, even though uh, the thrust of where we're going today is different. Friends, hold to unity. Remember what happens when we're united together. What happens is the joy that we saw pictured on this screen and that happens in our church as we meet together. Don't be drawn into quarreling over, over teachers or nationalism or politics. Keep unity through the bond of peace. So this These verses speak in depth about my life's work, our life's work. What is your life's work? What is the substance of it? And I want to urge you today that your life's work would be built on one foundation. As it says in these verses, in verse 10, by the grace God has given me, Paul writes, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Now, how do I do that? Uh, I'm certainly not saying that all of us should quit our jobs and start working full time in ministry all the time. Because if we did that, we would withdraw from the front line of our battle. We would cease to be the salt and the light in in this world. And that is what Jesus Christ wants. He is willing to risk the fact that we would suffer just as he suffered by being in the midst of people who are not Christian and do not share our values. And why would he do that? Because he realizes that if we are among them, we may save some. So what is your life's work? What are the things you're involved in that will be remembered by God for all eternity? As one old song has has put it, only the things that are done for Christ will last. And so the Apostle Paul urges us that we would do everything as unto the Lord. In Colossians 3, it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord and not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you're serving. And so I want to remind you that whenever we work, whatever our profession or role or responsibility, uh, whether we're working in a machine shop or we're raising our children, the goal for us is the same, that we would keep Christ Jesus at the forefront of our living, that we would remember that this very day is important to the Lord because in this day, he wants to reach to someone someone who is close to us, through us. He wants them to see himself, his love, his care in them. And so we're called literally to keep him in mind always in what we are doing. You see, Jesus does this because he knows that his work of bringing people into his kingdom happens every day through us as we are going through the usual routines of our daily lives. It's not just in crisis that that people come to the Lord Jesus. They come because they see him in you and in me. In a a film that came out recently uh, titled The The Case for Christ, it's a film about um, uh, a man who at that time already was, he was famous uh, in in the uh, the 70s and 80s as a a, uh, newspaper crime reporter. Okay, so I know we have to go back quite a ways, right? When newspapers had the role that social media now has, where you got your news from these newspapers and people trusted them more than they trusted anything that came on a screen. At that time, uh, newspaper journalists were seen as people who were constantly seeking for truth. And definitely Lee Strobel was one of those people. 
He had fully bought into the idea that, that as a reporter, he had freedom to seek for truth and that the papers would actually print what was true. And so Lee was confronted with a very difficult situation because he, as a committed atheist, uh, had to go through the, the, the very difficult problem of watching his wife come to faith in Jesus Christ, something that he did not believe in at all. And so Lee was challenged by one of his co-workers who happened to be a Christian and said, you know, you've got all of these skills. I mean, you've won these awards. You're, you're this hot shot reporter. You're the most skilled reporter in our whole department. Use your investigative crime reporting skills to check out the validity and the reality of the murder and resurrection of Jesus Christ and see what, how the facts line up. And Lee, after months of working on this, amassed so much evidence that, in fact, the Bible was accurate, that, in fact, Jesus Christ had lived, that, in fact, he definitely was crucified on a Roman cross, and that over 500 people saw him alive as he resurrected from the dead three days later. He was confronted with this evidence, and he realized that it was far, far greater than any possible evidence to the contrary. But even at that point, he realized, well, it's more reasonable for me to have faith in Christ than it is to not believe in God, but it still requires a leap of faith. And what was it that gave him the strength to make that leap? It was how he had watched Jesus Christ work in and through the life of his wife, Leslie, in the months since her conversion. Her daily life, her love for him, her forgiving of him, her willingness to stay connected through all of the difficulties that they face, that was the thing that gave him the impetus to say, that's it. I'm throwing in my lot with Jesus Christ. You may not know it, but Lee Strobel has written a number of novels, include, a number of books, including one called The Case for Christ. And he is one of the influential preachers of the last 50 years. He's still preaching and teaching in Houston to this day. And why is he doing that? Because basically through her example, his wife won him to Christ. You see, everything that we're doing in this life has the ability to be used by Jesus to impact those around us. What is your life's work? Is it what you're focused on that's in front of you, in your hands, or is it what's happening right alongside you? You see, Jesus can make any honorable occupation holy by being present through us as we live our work day, school day, child, child raising day for him. In this way, everything that we've done for Jesus will, and for his kingdom will be remembered. All of those conversations that are happening on the drive to school, those, those conversations that are happening uh, while, while cleaning up the house, while doing the dishes, while taking care of the yard, all of these things can have an incredible impact on the lives of those around us. All of those conversations that were had at camp during this last week, when people took time out of their daily lives to serve others, those are going to have impact in the kingdom of God. Now, it's important that we make Jesus our foundation by involving him in everything we do because the, our life's work, it says in these scriptures, our life's work is going to be put to the test. And, uh, you know, friends, uh, this is not just a feel-good gospel that comes from the pages of these books, of this book, the Bible, and that we preach in this church, right? Um, it's one of the reasons why I don't skip over things. And if you come on Wednesday, you'll see even more detail uh, taught about, about this, this whole chapter, right? The, at the beginning, Paul is saying, hey, look, I, I have to give you milk, not solid food, because you're still spiritual infants. I mean, that's, that's a pretty tough word for some of us, Right? And yet sometimes I have to wear that too, right? I have to say, wow, I, I'm not really living up to the standard. And just a few verses later, 
Paul says, hey, a test is coming for our life's work, yours and mine. Mine, yours, everybody. Nobody gets out of this test. And so let's let the scriptures confront us today. Paul writes this. He says, if anyone builds on this foundation, remember the foundation, Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. It's hard to communicate how how difficult this test could be for us. I mean, friends, it's so important that we get things right in this life. And here I'm not talking in any way about perfection. I'm talking about the attitude of our hearts. It's so important that we let Jesus Christ influence us in life, that we let him call the shots, that we let him have some of our time to use as he would choose because when we do that, Jesus is building with gold, with silver, with costly stones. He's building things that can withstand the fire of this test. I don't know what this test is going to look like. I, I don't know how that's all going to work. Is this symbolic? But what is certain is that the work that we have done, the time of our lives and how we have spent it, is going to be judged not by our standards of what is good, it's going to be judged by Jesus' standards of what is good. It's going to be judged by him. Was it valuable? Was it of eternal character? Did what you did in your life lead people to me? Or was your life lived for yourself, for your own pleasures, for the things of this world that you were seeking and grasping after, for security, for, for what you wanted, for what you thought was right? How often do we ask Jesus about that, about what we're doing, about what we're intending to achieve? Is he the one who is setting our goals for life, or is it someone, is it someone else called us? And if it is me or you that is setting my own goals, who is influencing me in doing that? Is it Jesus, or is it the enemy? Because the enemy, if he cannot get you to sin outright, is going to try and get you to waste the time of your life on building up things for yourself that are actually built of wood or hay or straw. Things that will be destroyed when the day of the Lord comes, when the test of fire comes. So even if our foundation is right, and this is the the fearful thing for me, even if my foundation is right, even if I myself know that I'm standing on Christ, but am I building my marriage the way Jesus Christ wants me to? Am I leading my home as a man the way Jesus Christ wants me to? Am I, am I asking for forgiveness for my sins the way he wants me to? Am I able to humble myself before my children, before my wife when I get things wrong? Am I able to in some way exemplify Jesus for them. As a mother, as I'm raising my children, am I able to raise them in the way that he wants? Yeah, the foundation is there, but how am I building day by day? Now, if this sounds like an impossible task, well, that's what it's like to follow Jesus, right? Following Jesus is an impossible task on our own. And I certainly am not exhorting you and calling you to follow Jesus by yourself. I'm not telling you to step out of the boat onto the water and expect it to hold you because there's something perfect and holy about you or about me. What I'm telling you to do, what I'm urging you to do, is to step out in faith, doing what God tells you to do, raising your kids in the way he tells you to, working your work life at work the way he tells you to in faith 
that his power will hold you up. In faith that he will work through you to influence the people around you. In faith that he will build with gold, with silver, with costly stones. Because that's the work that Jesus is promised to do in and through us when we give our lives over to him. And with this camp as a background to everything that I'm talking about today, I mean, that's a concentrated time when Jesus was able to influence so many people's lives through the sacrifice of many of our young people. And it's, it's great to see that happen in that time, and yet there's more to be done because those children who in that camp were set to look up to many of our young leaders they're going to keep looking at those guys and girls, aren't they? They're going to keep watching their lives. They're going to see how they live their lives, how they work at work, how they form their relationships, how they get married, how they raise their kids. Those people are going to be their examples as they're growing up in the Lord. So how are you building? Because, because God's watching, but more importantly, <laughs> People who look up to you are watching, and they know. They know you, and they love you, and they know that your life is built on Jesus Christ, and they're watching you so they can see how to build their own lives in the Lord, how they can learn to serve others because of the way that you serve them. So in that way, I would just ask and say, how? How is it happening for you? How are you building? What will the day reveal? None of us want to be the person running out of the build, burning building of our lives, saved but with the smell of smoke still on our clothes. We want to walk into God's kingdom and hear him saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy that has been prepared for you. And I trust that that is what you and I will be able to do because we will allow Jesus to work each day in our lives, being led by his spirit. Led by his spirit, not only in the big things, but in the everyday things. Led by his spirit in how we spend our time when no one is watching. Led by his spirit in how much we allow the influence of the world to dominate our thoughts, to dominate our free time, to dominate what we think about when when we're not concentrating on some task that we're doing, or maybe when we are. What is your mind filled with? Does the Spirit have the opportunity to speak to you? It says this in verse 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. Yes, there's a wisdom of this world that tells us to do things for ourselves, to pile up wealth, to do everything we can, to look good in front of other people. All of this stuff is foolishness. And when we're confronted by the fact that our lives have an end and that afterwards we must give account, that wisdom of the world is shown for the foolishness that it is. Why would we spend the, all of our life's energy piling up wealth for the last five, ten years of our lives, which we may not even get, when God says, no, you need to be investing in what comes after that ten years, in, in eternity that lasts forever. And I think, I praise God that I see so many of you investing in eternity by giving of the time of your lives now in the service of others with Jesus as your foundation. Now there's another scripture in here, another part of the scripture that is very important. If anyone destroys God's temple. Now friends, you've heard this taught before, I won't skip over it. And taking your own life is never the answer to any problem that anyone has. It's not something that we're allowed to do. Although the enemy is tempting people at a higher rate than ever before to do this, Friends, our lives were given to us as a gift from God that we might use them for him. Us ending our own life is putting ourselves in the place of God. It's never the solution. 
to what's going on. God is the one who brought us here. God is the one who needs to take us to himself. That is the way that he has set up the universe to work, and we must abide by that. But at the same time, look also at this side of that scripture. You and I are God's temple. How we live, how we think, we must always do in the consciousness that the Spirit of God is with us. The Spirit of God is in you. He wants to lead you. Do you allow him to do so? What do you fill your temple with? Well, there were many people on this stage who spent the last several weeks filling the temple of their heart and mind with, with ideas about how they could make this camp a success, with, with, with their passion for seeing young children come to know Jesus. And, and it was probably consuming for many of them the different things that they were doing. And some of them probably worried too much about how well things would go. And maybe that spoiled some of their enjoyment, right? The enemy's attacking us from every side. Even when we try to do good things, he'll try to make us worry. But to have your life dedicated to something so beautiful, it meant that the temple of your spirit was full of good things, was made pure by the decisions that you made to serve. So friends, what is your temple filled with today? What are the things that you are concentrating on? What are the things that you've placed as the goal of your life? One of the saddest times in the history of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, were during the times when the kings of Israel became wicked and started to serve the idols and the, the, the demonic gods of the people around them. Things became so bad that the kings of Israel would even set up to worship these idols in the temple of God itself. And when King Josiah, when he became king of Israel, and after several years when finally he became adult, and then God caused the book of the law to be found, and it was read in his presence, and he realized all of this stuff needs to go. Everything needs to be torn out. He purged the temple and he cleansed it. He tore out the quarters of the shrine prostitutes that had been built inside the temple of God. And those things were making it impossible for the people of God to hear the voice of God. Are there things in your life that are making it impossible for you to hear the voice of God? Are there things in your life that are draining your ability to serve God the way We've seen him being served over this last week. Are there persistent sins? Are there what seem like good desires, but they've taken over in your life that are pulling all of your emotional energy into themselves and leaving you dry? Friends, we can only, we can only work together with God in our lives if we're led by his spirit. And the spirit the Spirit is not going to outshout the cries of your idols, the cries of my idols. I have to take those idols and place them in the fire. I have to give them over to destruction. I have to leave them behind so that I can hear the voice of God and so that his power can live within me and so that I can be used by him to be his, his voice, his hands, his feet, to his people. Now, I would be remiss if I also did not remind that in our church there are so many ministries that, re that need help right now. There was a great team of people up here that did this camp, and that was awesome. And yet, there could be more. And if there had been more, several different leaders' jobs would have been so much easier. Not only that, there are a number of ministries in this church that we need to start and we can't start because there aren't people to be involved in them. There's a need for those that do hospitality. There's a need for those who, who, would, uh, who would be ushers. There's a need for those who would teach Sunday school. There's a need for those who would help with men's ministry. There's a need for those who would help with women's ministry. You name it. Almost every ministry in our church needs actually someone like you 
someone who's not yet involved to be part of it. Because you bring the uniqueness that God has created within you into that service. And God wants to speak through you to the new people that he's bringing into our midst all the time. Our church has experienced quite a bit of growth over these last few years, and it's grown because people are willing to like pour their hearts into others the way this group that was on stage did, the way all of the people who are serving to make these worship services have do week after week, singing their hearts out for you, the way that people do during the week, serving during the year when our, our kids almost every day, teaching them music, teaching them about Jesus. And yet all of these ministries and several that need to start, they need you. They need you to be involved. And here I'm not talking to those people who are already giving all they've got. I'm talking to the people who aren't yet doing that so that those people who are actually giving too much can be more balanced in their life and in their living. So, friends, as I challenge you with that today, I leave it in the Spirit's hands. And as we come to a time of prayer, I, I want to plead with you to examine the condition of your heart and your soul today. Is there something that is preventing you from walking with Jesus the way he wants you to walk today? Is there something that is keeping you from giving of yourself to him in the way that he would want? Not in the way I would want. Not in the way I think is right. There's no way I can lead you into what Jesus wants you to do, and I'm not supposed to, and I'm grateful that I'm not supposed to. But I also know that Jesus Christ is the one speaking to some people here today, that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about what he wants you to do. And he's using this opportunity that we have as a church coming together like this to impress upon you, what is it that I need to do for God's church? Who do I need to become today so that I can do the things God wants me to do? What changes do I need to, to make in my life? What do I need to give up? What do I need to lay aside? What do I need to repent of, to cast on the altar, to give over to God by fire so that it's destroyed and it never comes back in my life? I don't know what the answers to those questions are, but I know that you know. I know that you know what they are. And I'd ask you to stand with me as we have a chance to pray before the Lord today. And before we end uh, our service in a wonderful song of worship today, let's just have a moment to examine our hearts and to give to the Lord uh, the opportunity, Holy Spirit, to work in us. 